Hi guys, today we have a story that isn't something we normally do. It's about a young girl wanting to be a hero, and I thought it was pretty cute. It's awesome as fuck! Yeah, it's pretty cute. I'll give you that. So before we start, hit subscribe and give us a like and leave a comment. Now, let's get started. TG, I come to regale you with the story of hopefully, aww, a story of my little daughter and her fairy tale hero. It started off about midsummer. My daughter being four, going on five, and about to enter kindergarten. She had taken a liking to fantasy tales, heroes and knights, princesses and villains. Normally I'd sing her a lullaby of some such, but being a fan of TG's, I was more than happy to oblige my daughter with some stories. Then one night it all changed. I had decided to tell her the story of a young squire called Thomas, based off a fighter I had played once, and she stops me and asks a question. At the time Thomas was on a quest to escort a lost peasant girl back home and was about to charge head first to fight some bugbears. Dad, why doesn't he avoid the bugbears? He might put the girl in danger, and you said he wasn't stupid too. Any of my daughter's quotes will be paraphrased somewhat. I paused and thought I couldn't tell her the actual answer, being that the fighter had a diplomacy and sneak skill worth nothing. So I asked her what Thomas should do, and there started her new bedtime stories. Choose your own adventure stories. From then on she decided what Thomas did, from taking only a kiss from the maiden instead of gold. I couldn't convince her to take both, to switching to a club to fight the woodland animals like wolves. They didn't know better, she thought it was wrong to kill them. After we together finished the tale of Thomas, I decided to start up another one right away. We were both having too much fun for this to end, but who would be the hero? Naturally, being D&D, along with Choose Your Adventure, I had her choose. At first I had her pick from some heroes I would make up, a stealthy Robin Hood-esque rogue, a knight in shining armour, a young handsome wizard, or the crazed but kind-hearted barbarian. Many a great fun tale we had, exploring huge caverns, forgotten tombs and temples, even saving cities and damsels along the way, all along my daughter telling more and more of the story herself. Now this would be around mid-September. After many tales, my daughter would ask me questions about wizards or monsters and such, and one day she asked me about bards. Daddy, what are bards? You say they do magic, but then they just tell stories or sing. Are they adventurers too? So I explained, yes they are. They are adventurers who seek out old stories to tell people, and who make new ones along the way. They make magic with music and tales, their songs enchant people. They can make them dance or sleep or obey their words. She seemed to like the idea, asking more and more questions. By this point, I'm already planning on getting her to do these games when she's a little older. I can see her playing bards now. Now, a few days later, when she had decided Thog, she really likes the name Thog for any big man in these stories. <laughs> <laughs> the berserker had enough fun for the day and needed a rest at the tavern. She asked me again about bards. She asked if the bard playing at the tavern that night had any children, not wanting to go anywhere near the traditional answer for if a bard had any kids. I told her yes, and that his son and wife were upstairs and travelling with the bard on his journey. She seemed to fall in love with the idea of the bard and his family out on adventures. Flash forward to last week. We were wrapping up Thog's tale. She asked me if the next hero could be a bard. I was not about to say no, so the plan was set. I just need to think up a few starting quests and a little bit of character for the bard to get her started. So that story started tonight, but what happened today is what nearly made me cry. My daughter in kindergarten had plenty of little shows or activities they would invite parents in to see. Today was one such day. They had apparently been working on a little project as a surprise for the parents. The children had to make a little essay on what their parents did for a living and the parents got invited in to see just how close or normally far off they were. My little girl started to read her essay and this is how it went. My daddy's job is very special. My daddy is a hero. Whenever I need anything, my daddy is there for me. And if I ever am hurt or sad or lonely, my daddy comes to rescue. But he not just any hero, he is a bard. My daddy can tell all kinds of stories of big strong knights and smart magic men and he can sing songs and play instruments too. Before I was sad when my daddy had to go away on trips, but now I'm excited because he's going on adventures, to help other people and tell stories there too. 
I love my daddy. My daddy is a hero. To my little girl, I was a bard. I told stories, I sang, I was magic. I was her hero. I left her to go on adventures and came back with more tales. Seeing my girl that excited and hearing her say this, I couldn't be happier. Then tonight, as I started the story, she asked me a question. Could the bard have a family too? Could he have his wife and their daughter be on the adventures too? I called my wife into the room and we started our adventure together. That's my tale, folks. I don't know why I put it here. I just felt the need to share this somewhere. It probably won't seem as sweet or cute to anyone else, but damn it, I'm her hero now, and I need to live up to it. Does anyone know where I can get a bitchin' bard hat to wear? <laughs> Alright, it's time to tell of Cat's Halloween. Still midway through the tale of Thog, Cat's exact words were, I want to be a big, wild, scary, choppy man like Thog. <laughs> <laughs> This was going to be a fun Halloween. However, Party City and the other stores failed to have the little berserker I'd fit in stock. So I managed to talk her down to being a knight this year. On the promise I'd make her a barbarian outfit myself next year. I will do it too. I want to see her run around in it. So we find a good white knight costume. And one odd look from the cashier later, we were off and ready. Now her outfit, while still pretty cheap, was a full on knight get up. A little plastic helmet with a visor and a feather crest as well. So the days leading up to Halloween were spent with her strutting around the house, fighting off monsters that always seem to disappear just as I step into the room. Learning swordplay as best as a five-year-old could manage with a dinky plastic blade. Only tripping once or twice in the outfit and generally full of her amazing cuteness. Then came Wednesday, October 31st. And Caitlin the Brave and Dashing of the Southern Woods, self-given title, set off on her adventure for treasure and sweets, but mostly sweets. Now, as we went off to the other neighbourhoods in the area, Cat ran into a few other knights and squires and even a few strange eastern warriors. Artists. James. <laughs> she had asked me what a knight would call a samurai or a ninja. That's all I came up with. She verily tried to get them to join her quest and even have a few agree. Soon she had her own little adventuring party, made up of herself, two ninjas, another knight, and Iron Man. <laughs> God, don't. This is so cute. Oh, it's I told her to look out for a wizard to join. Now throughout the night, she had left an impression on many peasants, mostly by actually referring to the candy givers as peasants. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> no, really. After the knight and his parents join our party. At the next house, once she had received her candy, my daughter said, Thank ye, peasant. You have been help on a noble quest. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I will never forget the look in that woman's face <laughs> as Kat walked back to me. <laughs> Aside from that, she challenged others to duels, led her party to battle by telling them when it was safe to cross the street and was simply the greatest knight I have ever seen. And then she found a mount. Oh, I hope no. <laughs> a while into the night, when we decided it was best to start making a circle back home, we find a house that had a dog. Stink. A big, fat sheep dog. Now, plenty of people like to dress up their pets in Halloween. The very nice couple at this house decided to dress their dog up as a horse, with a toy cowboy on its back. They dressed it up as a horse with a saddle. Normally, I figured Kat would have run up to the dog, demanding to pet it, but tonight she stood still, staring at the dog that had a saddle while she was dressed as a knight without a mount. Daddy, daddy, daddy! I need that horse! I need to ride it! What do I say to my daughter here? Luckily, I didn't need to say anything, because as I was trying to think of an answer, she ran up to the couple to get her candy and asked them herself. So, while excitedly hopping up and down, she said, can I ride the horse? I'm a knight. I am killing the brave and dashing, but I need a horse. Once again, a pair of faces I will never forget that moment. Now I was going to walk up and apologize to them. But the man there, the man who is now a very good friend to me, says to my daughter, I don't know you, young knight. Do you feel you're worthy to ride one of the king's own horses? Of course I am. I have defeated monsters, goblins and bugbears. I've even defeated an ogre with a smile on his face. Very well, young one, come with me. He took the little cowboy off the dog's back and untied him from the tree. 
He looped the leash around the collar to make a crude rein and let my daughter jump on. Now the dog of course was a little uncomfortable with a child suddenly jumping on its back but the owner fed him some treats and calmed him down. Now I'm willing to bet the next 20 or so minutes were the best of my daughter's young life. I really couldn't stop thanking the man and his wife enough. He would lead the dog around the yard taunting him with treats, give the kids a pony ride while Kat slashed at the monsters coming to invade the king's castle. Okay, his house was big, but I wouldn't call it a king's castle. After Kat got off and gave the other kids rides too, I did really feel sorry for the dog, however. He seemed tired afterwards. Oh. And that was Kat's Halloween. She found an adventuring party, got aid from some peasants, found treasure and sweets, and even got to be a knight on a horseback. Though I have never met a knight that got so tired that she needed to be carried home. Now I have that promise to you, TG, fulfilled. I must take another leave for an hour or two, but maybe I will be back with more adventures of Kat to share with you all, if you're interested. So this was a tale I was not there for, but it was regaled to me by my wife, along with a lot of blame, and on explaining the boundaries to my daughter about real life and my silly fantasy worlds. She was a wee bit mad. Before the tale, some geography first. Near my neighbour there is a small forest with a nice creek running through. This is where Of the Southern Woods and her nightly name came from. This was a setting for many a tale I told her and became a wonderful magic place to her, which were no more than 50 feet from her house. One day, late August, Kat asked my wife so she could go to the woods to play with her friends, Rick and Amber. Now normally I say an adult must be with them out there for them to play. So either my wife made an exception or they said one of the other kids' parents was going with them. They lied. So off the three go to have a day of fun in the woods, playing and being heroes. For that day's adventure, Caitlin had decided that a princess had become lost in the woods and needed a group of brave, albeit small heroes to save her. So off they went past thickets of trees over mountains, boulders in the woods, through a raging river, Little Creek, all in hopes of finding the lost girl. Then suddenly, Rick had a flash of insight. If the princess was lost and scared, she would be hiding, so they wouldn't see her. They needed to call out to her to get her out of hiding. So after a few moments of arguing to decide what her name would be, they settled on Lisa. They began to call, Lisa, we are here to find you. Lisa, where are you? Lisa? As they wandered the woods, they drew close to the backyards of other homes as well. Homes where housewives were relaxing in the backyard. Hearing a shrill child's cry, one such wife came out to see the issue. Now Caitlin was a serious role player. She dared not to break character. And since she did not, neither did Amber or Rick. So they told the lady of their quest to find the lost girl Lisa in the woods. Now this worried the housewife greatly. A girl was lost in the woods, so she called out her neighbour. She needed help in the search and she called her neighbour and so on and so forth. Eventually, even my wife was called. She believed Lisa was a new friend of Kat's. So when I returned home to a very worried wife telling of Kat's lost friend and many persons in the woods calling out for poor Lisa, I found Kat watching TV in the living room. I asked what had happened to her friend, Lisa. And she says to me, who's Lisa? Oh, Lisa, the princess who got lost. We were going to finish the adventure tomorrow, daddy. What's for dinner? So after a little more talking with her, I had the unfortunate task of going out and explaining to all of the people searching what had happened. To cut out some needless parts, we're all here for tales of cat after all. It took roughly an hour and a half to round up all the searching people. I then had to explain that it was all a child's game. The mob was not happy. Now while they decided to begin slinging insult as to my parenting skills, Kat decided to come out and see what was happening. She did not like what she saw. She came up and grabbed my hand and asked what was wrong. A mother in the crowd decided to yell at her. You, you should be ashamed, lying to all of us about a lost girl. That is no joke. This is when Kat started to cry. I'm sorry, if somebody what, what, started shouting at my she kid, she'd be getting a shoe bounced off her head. I'm <laughs> sorry. The Nobody's talking to my kid like that. They're fucking, fuck they're playing. Fuck I'd be telling my child to go in and get her sword and start slapping the woman on <laughs> This is what Kat spoke through her tears. I'm so sorry. I just thought that she wanted to play with us. I thought she was calling more friends. Daddy plays with me all the time and she never said anything to me. She just ran right off to get her friends and didn't even ask what we were playing. 
At this point, more than a few faces in the little mob seemed ashamed. They did just make a little girl cry. While it did take some more talking, and a teary promise from Kat to say it's a game next time, they did leave without incident. Once we were inside, I noticed Kat had stopped crying rather quickly. Daddy, when a hero lies to do good, it's okay, right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, she's a bally bitch. So it's time for Kat's hero show again. Again a tale I was not there for myself, but Kat's teacher was more than willing to share with me what happened. As a part of the class, they had to, very simply, put on a mini play for the class. Get some characters, some lines, maybe a costume, and put on the show with a small group. Now most kids went to their parents, asked for help, and ended up doing Shakespeare. (laughs) Not my daughter. I didn't even know she had this project until the teacher called and told me what a wonderful job my daughter did. She did a classic damsel in distress story. The evil bandit made off for the blacksmith's beautiful daughter. A brave but inexperienced squire set off to save her. The cast was as followed. Caitlin as the squire, Amber as the damsel, a boy named Jack as the bandit, and another boy named Adam, who was the blacksmith and the puppet master. And finally, a multitude of sock puppets to be the monsters. I heard it was an amazing show. The opening scene was Amber simply picking some flowers outside the village. When suddenly, an evil bandit comes and grabs the girl, and with an evil laugh, as best a young boy could master, I'm told, shouts, <laughs> now I have you now I will steal you and force you to be my wife <laughs> ah, little kids and with the damsel shrieking he stole her away then in rides the squire to town and ends up meeting the blacksmith and after a little chatter the squire has accepted the quest and off she runs into the woods along the way she fought a great host of monsters it seems from a small marker green sock goblin to a big brown sock bear, even, or so I'm told, a vile, fire-breathing sock dragon with the most horrible pair of googly (laughs) eyes you will ever see. (laughs) But after many a trail, she finds herself at the bandit lair. Inside, the damsel was tied to an orange plastic chair. (laughs) The horror! (laughs) Oh! Dun, dun, dun! (laughs) And the... And the bandit was getting the wedding bands ready to steal her fate. But the young squire would not stand for this. And with a yell, leaped in to fight the bandit. After a dramatic waving of plastic swords. With only one injury in the mix. That's not bad going. Not bad. The squire defeats the bandit. After untying the damsel, he takes her back to town safe and sound. When the blacksmith asks the squire what reward he requires, the squire answered thusly. A true hero needs no reward. I fight for good, and that's a reward itself. I want nothing more than for you to promise to keep her safe, my good man. And with that, the squire rode off into the sunset. Off to the next adventure. She got an A in the project. Hey, Hey. that's nice. On August 20th, a few years ago, a little girl was born to me. And this year, like every year, we celebrate her name day. Now this year, she had asked for a very specific party idea. Three guesses for UTG for what it was. So when the day came, we had erected a cheap cardboard castle, painted by the wife, but two dozen cheap plastic swords to hand out instead of party bags, and got a fearsome dragon kick. The party was going splendidly, as the hero of the day overcame the dragon's fiery breath, chopped off its head and made herself a wish. As the day wore on, We had to keep the cattle from hurting themselves with their new toy swords. We started the games for the day. The first game was a simple one really. Pin the tail on the donkey, but replace the donkey with Rapunzel and the tail with overly long hair. Oh, that's nice. So whoever pinned the hair to your head had saved the princess and got a prize. The hero for that game was a boy named Robert from Cat's class. Then we moved on to the archery competition. A simple task really. Throw three darts and pop the balloons on a board. Most balloons popped wins the day. Due to this competition, I am now terrified by a little girl called Kelly because she made all three shots and I don't think she even blinked. Caitlin, perhaps a little disappointed with herself for not winning, was eager for the next game. The next game was the treasure hunt, so I gathered the kids round and told them of their quest. In the woods to the south, there hides a note by the mouth. 
follow its clues and find a treasure, but do not delay for petty pleasures. After a quick translation from my wife being, go to the mouth of the creek of the woods and find the clues. Follow the clues and you'll find a treasure chest. And I go on. <laughs> <laughs> and then the kids raced off. Cat having a little bit of an advantage knowing exactly where the creek was. Once there, she found the clue. Good job so far, my young hero. But now it's time for clue zero. Go to the place where the youngest play. Hidden in the seat will be a treat. And on the back was a translation for the kids. Go to the playground and look near the slide. At the playground tape beneath the slide was the second clue. Cat was there first, but she was not too far ahead from the rest of the group. That clue read, One down, two to go. Head to the west, now you know. Take a step up, ring the bell, say hello and check the dell. And the translation? Head across the street to Mrs Connotella's house and ring the doorbell. Ask for the clue she has that should be by her computer. She's quite a nice old lady. I could continue telling the clues, but let's skip to the bones of the story. The series of clues played out the adventure for Kat and her friends. From searching through the woods to climbing high and low in search of those elusive little sheets of paper. Some taped right onto trees, other hidden on nearby wagons. Volkswagens. <laughs> <laughs> and then came the time when the grip, which had more or less clumped into one semi-coherent party, found the chest at last. But this was an adventure, and a hero could not simply waltz in and claim the treasure. Every chest is guarded, in this case by a skeletal champion. So in my house in the hallway, leading up to the bedrooms, I stood in a black cloak, with a skull mask on and a cheap plastic axe. Behind me, a toy chest full of candy, party toys and gold chocolate coins. And in front of me, the largest halfling adventure party I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> this was going to be a fun night, getting my ass kicked by five-year-olds. But before I could say a word, I hear Kat yell, RETREAT! While one of her friends yelled, WE NEED A PLAN! So I was left alone in the hallway, waiting and slightly afraid while they came up with an attack plan. And what a plan it was. First came in Kelly, armed with a plastic bag full of little rubber balls. Oh shit. Her aim was as good with these as with the darts. And it was more or less all I could do was try and dodge them. And then the rest of the horde attacked. You'd be surprised how easily a swarm of five-year-olds can take you down. I'm just glad I didn't land on any of them. Needless to say, they won the battle and had a little too much fun jabbing me with their toy swords. <laughs> they claimed the chest and shared the bounty. A happy end to a day-long adventure. Later that night, after the clean-up and a little before bed, Kat came to sit by me in the living room. She kissed me and thanked me for the best birthday she had ever had. So it was a lazy Saturday afternoon. Kat was running around the house chasing our little dog around. I was attempting to watch television and my wife was complaining about all the stray cats in the neighbourhood. Now a few strays is normal in some neighbourhoods, but my wife apparently had gotten tired of the ones around here. Someone has been feeding them it seems and now they won't leave people alone. Little demons scratched my leg whenever I was outside getting meal. Cat only seemed to hear the word demon and outside. Now at the time I didn't put it together, but Cat asked if she could go outside and play. Since it was the afternoon and many a child and parent outside, I said it was okay, fully intending to follow her out. She however had other plans, dashing out of the house before I could even stand up. I get outside to find her crouching and looking around the corner of the house into the backyard. She then decides to leap out of cover and roll across the lawn to hide behind the neighbour's house. She gets about halfway and scrambles to get back into cover. I asked her what she was doing and I got shushed. If you talk too loud, it'll hear us. Then it'll escape. When I looked in the backyard, I saw one of the cats. Now things got real. I know this because Cat put on her serious face, which was a sort of cross between pouting and an angry look. Anyway, Cat says to me, We need to work together to capture such a powerful creature. You go around and we can flank him. My smart girl knew well enough about flanking to suggest it. So I played along strolled along the other side of the house to help her capture the demon. Before I made it, I heard an angry yell from a little girl. I ran up and saw her looking at the roof. Now, in her backyard there's an oak tree and a trampoline, but that's for later. Some of the branches get a rather close to the house. Wife wants them cut down, I've been lazy. So when Kat tried to stalk the cat, she seemed to have rolled a one. 
It bolted up the tree, jumped from a branch, and now it had its ass planted on my roof. Cat wanted the kitty to come down, so I told her to wait and I would get the ladder. Now I couldn't have been away for more than five minutes tops. I just needed to open the garage and get the ladder. I come back out and find my daughter on the roof, staring down an annoyed looking cat. I still do not fucking know how she got up there. Now, at the time I had stopped being the fun, playful dad and because the worried yelling, oh shit, what the fuck, get down from there, dad. As it so happens, that startled the cat and caused it to run off the roof, landing safely on its feet on the ground. Now cat had a choice. She could A, wait for me to get the ladder up and pull her down, or B, follow the demon and catch it. She wanted that cat. So she jumped after it, off the roof, off a two-story house, and was smart enough, but not smart enough to not jump off the roof, to aim for the trampoline. (laughs) So she landed on it and still managed to touch the ground through it, or so she told me, breaking two of the metal strings in the process. They were rather rusty and old though, hurting her bum and nearly squishing the cat and causing it to literally shit itself in fear. Now, during this process, I was screaming my head off. I ran right up to make sure she was fine, but she jumped off the damaged trampoline and went to pick up the currently shitting cat. It was too scared to move, I guess, the poor thing, but she caught it. Then she turned and smiled and like any five-year-old, asked to keep it. (laughs) Like fucking hell. She didn't get the cat, she got a goddamn lecture by jumping off the fucking roof. Several days of no fun and a spanking from her mother. She didn't trust me to do it for some reason. So I, as a father, did what any worried and angry father did. Cat, while not happy at the end of the day, did a few weeks later admit that she felt amazing doing it. Now, I had to be honest with her. I told her it was amazing, but if she ever did it again, I would tan her hide. Her response? I won't let you see then. <laughs> ah, she sounds like me as a kid. I was such a wee bitch. I know, I know. Last night I was sharing a tear-jerking tale of my daughter. Tonight I am being a bard in earnest, but very well, I will begin. Now this takes place after the demon cat slash house jumping slash no fun time episode. A sunny day and Cat was once again allowed to have fun, but with a more watchful eye. And last night I told Kat a story of nights jousting, so naturally she wanted to try it. She had asked to ride her bike up and down the street for a while, and I obliged. After a short while, her friend Richard comes... Who who the hell names her child Richard (laughs) this day and age? I'm sorry. (laughs) After a short while, her friend Richard comes along on his bike. Then Kat starts whispering to him, for a bit longer than what would have made me comfortable. She then comes and asks me if they could play nights. I say yes, of course, and Kat goes to get toy swords and shields. Once she's back outside, they get back on their bikes. Then they start pedalling in opposite directions. That is where I had to stop them. I saw this one coming at the very least. But daddy, we're knights. We need to joust. Sure, but just not with swords and shields at full speed on a bike. But she did seem to really have her heart set on this, so I decided why not. I could set up a safe child's joust, couldn't I? How hard could it be? <laughs> Leave the kid with dad for one hour. <laughs> the kids are joisting up and down the street. Oh, sake. Not too hard at all. A few cones out of the garage and some rope, and I had the post set up. Pull noodles for lances, some extra padding and protection for the riders, and some other giggling parents to act as judges. And we had our neighbourhood joust all set up. And for the grand prize was a slice of apple pie. The kids now had a reason to win. Now, what started off with just Kat and Richard, drew in a few more kids, who called some of their friends, who called more, and then some kids walking by saw all the excitement and joined in too. Long story short, there was a full crowd, no car was going to get through that street, and we had an honest to god rooster and matching set up for this thing that was just supposed to be a game for my kid. God, I love my neighbourhood. All we needed was Mr Rogers. And so the joust began. The judges were instructed to judge based on whose lance was the truest of aim and who kept their mount the steadiest. The children would ride bikes down at each other on other sides of the posts and try to hit the noodles of the other shield. We also rotated judges so no one would be judging on their own child. It was a long, fun, trying day. 
one or two children were truly dismounted and had to be led away with a few scraped knees, but no other injuries. The event grew so large we had to postpone the latter half of the jousting to the second day. I am proud to say Kat easily made it to that second day. On the morrow at high noon, the jousting once again began. As the joust went on, the number of knights dwindled, but the number of spectators always grew. Towards the end of this day, there were about six jousters left and the judges had trouble deciding among them on every joust. Cat among them, of course. Now, instead of having these tired, battered knights ride anymore, they were all declared winners and each was to share in the pie. At that announcement, the crowd cheered and began to congratulate the knights left. After the field was cleaned and the celebration was over and all the pie was eaten, some of the other parents came to talk to me. They wanted to organise another joust sometime soon. This tale takes place during the summer, on a family camping trip where Kat saw a real forest for the first time, not just the tiny woods by our neighbourhood. After a long car ride to the middle of nowhere, Kat braved the blistering heat to explore the new area. She then demanded to help set up the tent. After a bit of fun, where she managed to tangle up two of the poles, the sun was still high, the tent was set and we were all getting hungry. And then Kat asked me if we were going to hunt for food. I couldn't help myself. I said we were, and that her first job as a hunt woman was to catch a squirrel. She spent the next 20 minutes looking for squirrels, and even chased one down before it bolted up a tree. After that, I told her we had brought hot dogs. <laughs> now we had a propane stovetop, but campfire cooking would be more fun for all of us. So Kat and me headed deeper into the trees to hunt for firewood. Now deeper in, we could better hear the insects and birds. Kat seemed amazed and a little nervous here, but understood. All the trees here were taller, the leafy canopy thicker, the animals more common and perhaps a little wilder. But still, it was odd seeing Kat clinging close to me. After finding many a log and plenty of twigs, we came back to start the fire and get the hot dogs cooking. So after that mighty meal, with only two hot dogs dropped into the fire pit, which were removed, we started off on a day of fun which consisted mostly of follow Kat around as she explored the area, but it was fun nonetheless. When the sun started to set and we started back to camp, Kat walked a little slower, closer, but I chalked it up to being tired. And tired she was. The sun had already set and already she was set for bed. She then asked me a little favour. Could we sleep outside in our sleeping bags like the heroes do? I was fine with it, her mother too, as long as she took a cot and mosquito net as well. So Kat and me went out to sleep beneath the stars. My wife opted to stay in the tent. As always, Kat wanted a story and I told her them. And tonight she wanted a much longer story than normal. But eventually I got her to bed. Much later that night, nature called to me, so I answered nature. But when I walked back, I heard Kat calling out softly. Daddy, Daddy, please come back. Kat was scared. And when I got there, I realized Kat was crying too. The forest to her while fun in the open areas and during the day, was terrifying for her at all else. The tall trees seemed to lean down on her ready to fall. The dark wasn't quiet or gentle like at home. She could hear the animals and bugs around her. And of course, now she was out in the open and alone, and she awoke to find me not there. Once I calmed her down enough, I relit the fire and sat down with her. She was shaking a little bit and still looked ready to cry. I had to do something and she gave me a clue. She asked me for another story, so I told her more. But I opted for stories of rangers and druids, the hero that was the bravest in the woods, those that were kind to animals so that they would be kind in return. And that is how we spent the entirety of the first night, just us and many stories. Come morning we had our breakfast, where I explained what transpired to my wife. And I went out and carved a stick to be a toy sword for Cat on the trip. Now we head out for a fun day, but come that night again, Kat was still a wee bit frightened. But in the tent this time, with both mother and father, and more stories, she felt better, and fell asleep sooner. Each night was like that, with her feeling better and better and braver, until around Thursday, when she finally seemed to be at ease. That night she went to bed with no incident, and found the forest to be a magical place. She even had the gall to whine when we had to pack and leave. This tale begins with an unexpected visit from my brother, with his two boys in tow. It was a day filled with false courtesies and pretending I'd give a damn about his work and troubles, of which he had endless complaints. 
At the very least, Kat had fun playing with her cousins. Now his two children are seven and four, but apparently never heard story about knights in their short lives. So that day, Kat got to be the storyteller, leading them off with an interesting rendition of Thomas's adventures with bugbearers. Now, halfway through the story, Kat decided she needed to show and not merely tell the story. So she found her sword and shield and declared the two boys to be bugbearers attempting to attack her. This concept greatly confused the two, they not knowing what a bugbearer is. After much explanation from Kat and even her finding my monster manual and showing them a picture of one, they finally got the gist of it. At this point, my brother had stopped droning and we were simply watching them out of interest. Kat then found a doll of hers to serve as a damsel and the fight began. The next scene amounted to two boys screaming in terror as a young girl suddenly came at them swinging a little plastic sword. After we calmed them, well, my brother did, I was too busy laughing. They explained they played pretend in a different way. Essentially, they shouted out whatever it was they were about to do, so no one would be surprised and could play along with it. I later learned my brother taught them to play as such in the hopes that one shouting, I'm going to hit you with an X, would avoid injuries. Kat was slightly annoyed, but agreed to alter her play for them. They then started afresh with Kat yelling, I'm going to smite ye with my blade and charging again. The older boy then yells, I knocked the sword out of your hand. Kat stops and stares at him. That's not how the story went. But then, what's the point? Can we just play? Kat considered this and said, okay, with a smile and threw the blade to the side. Then yells, foul beast, I will bash you with my shield then. The older boy calls out again, you can't do that, shields aren't a weapon, that's not fair. It doesn't matter. If I hit you with it, it'll hurt. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> I had to stop her from hitting him. It doesn't matter. It's not a weapon and you have to play fair. Cut in the interest of more pretend relents. Fine. I dive for my sword. And leaps. The young cousin then has something to say. You can't. I was over here and I picked it up. But you were over there. How could you? I never said I was over there. I was over here. So I have it now. Cat was looking very annoyed. Fine, whatever. Younger cousin, I attack you with the sword. Cat, I block it. Younger cousin, nah I go around the shield when you try. The little brat has to win, it seems. My brother was getting a chuckle out of it. Cat annoyed greatly now. Fine, but when you hit me, it just hits my armour, and I grab the sword from your hand. And she yanks the blade from him. Younger cousin, brother, help! Older cousin, I'm gonna knock you down and proceeds to barrel down my daughter. I had to stop that and have a little talk with them about roughhousing. But then it was back to play. Cat with her sword and the two bugbears facing her down. She yells again, I'm going to smite you with my sword. And both the bugbears yell this time, We dodge it! And Cat had to smile at least. They seemed to finally get it. Then they shout, And we throw rocks at you. Where did the rocks come from? The ground, duh. They bounce off my armour. Then I throw a huge rock with both my arms. I roll out of the way. Then I jump on you. I stab you as you try. I throw another big rock at you. But I'm holding you down. But I stabbed you. You can't dodge it and stab me at the same time. I can too. Then I knock your sword away when I grab you. Then I use my shield to hit you. You can't use your shield like that. And the tale continues on in that fashion for quite some time. My daughter slowly entering the I need to beat them just to prove a point mindset eventually. Somewhere in the end result had both the bugbears mounted on dinosaurs and Cat having a 40 foot lance. That called down lightning like Zeus was having a field day. Anyway, at this point simply shouting out bigger and weirder items into the fray wasn't working. So the boys started calling in more bugbears. With all of us, we just rush in and beat you. You can't beat us all. Cat, annoyed, frustrated, and never having to actually tell her story, gives up. Fine, you win, I don't care, and storms off to her room. That being the end of play, my brother decided it was time to leave. Once his kids finished their little victory dance, I went off to see how Cat was doing, and hopefully to explain why the little boys acted how they did. But I couldn't open my mouth, however. She spoke first. Next time, I'll just tell a story. They don't know how to play right, do they? It'll be better for them if I just make them listen. They aren't like my friends. If I don't make them do it, they'll ruin everything. 
She didn't seem mad, it was more of disappointment. And sure enough, when I asked, she said she wasn't mad. But she did ask a question. Do they really have fun that way? So that's the short tale. Cat becomes frustrated, then learns about railroading trouble grips. I wonder if I should tell her otherwise. What do you think, TJ? Anyway, the zoo it is. Now this was fairly recent, as it was a kindergarten trip to the local zoo. I, who was a volunteer to chaperone by the wife, decided to bring along the monster manual as both a joke and to hopefully have fun with Cat as well. Once at the zoo, however, Cat demanded to hold it. I need to be able to find out what monsters I'm looking at. It took nothing more than five steps off the bus before she had her little group of friends with her to find the monsters. And off we go to see the monsters. Now the first exhibit we visited that day was the monkeys. The tour guide described them as small and impish as they tended to like to play jokes on the guests. The word imp made everything easy for Kat, quickly finding imps in the manual. Then discovering that imps normally had magic and fireballs and the like, quickly declared that they all needed to watch out because the monkeys would trick us to look away then burn us all. Now the tour guide was just confused, the teacher just sort of sighed. After a few moments of staring, the tour guide led us away. <laughs> <laughs> the next cage held a pair of bears, easy enough for Cat to find, but not fun enough to play with. Soon they became dire bears, still simple, but slightly less boring. She had to ask, however, to the tour guide, do you cut their spikes off? I decided then to explain to that poor lady what was going on instead of just letting her suffer. The lady, while understanding the outburst now, somewhat, it was more or less chalked up to childish imagination, did not seem to want to play along, so Kat was on her own for entertainment today. The next exhibit was wolves, that quickly became wargs. She could tell by the grotesque jaw of one of the wolves. It was yawning. (laughs) And clearly the zookeeper feeding them at the time was a hobgoblin that was to be slain later on that day. The hyenas were gnolls in disguise, the gorillas bugbears, and we came to the crocodile exhibit, the highlight of the day because Kat got to see dragons that day. Now the exhibit for crocodiles was rather extensive because it seems crocodiles are racist. They hate different coloured ones and fighting among them so they keep them separate. While Kat found these separate cages filled with blue, green and a few white albinos, scaly beasts. They were clearly ice, lightning and poison dragons. But also this is where a little trouble started and a bit of fun I had to end. Now Kat walked up to the tour guide and asked a question. How do you get in to feed them? She answered her. There's a door right around back if you go in the building. She then scampered back to her friends, and I had to follow. Tell her that no, today was not the day to slay dragons. (laughs) But dad, what could be better? Watching druids and rangers put on shows with beasts. And that was that, we moved on. Cat eager for a show. Further in zone, they had an elephant show with clearly druid magic. For how else could such a large beast balance on a ball? and the well-trained griffins who flew through rings in the air, and even a few wargs that danced. It was a magical day for Kat, where the shows came to life in a new way. On the bus back to the school, Kat asked me a question. Could I learn to do that? Could I be a druid like them? Of course you can. My daughter wants to be a zookeeper now. I absolutely love these stories. It was only meant to be like one or two stories we were going to read and then we find more and I couldn't help myself. Yeah. Oh, too shit. <laughs> it kind of kept going. Honestly, yeah. It kind of kept going and going. And I was like, no, we'll just do this other one and then we'll stop it. No, yeah. here, wait, here, here's another one. Well, here's another one. Um, there is a few more. I know this isn't a, a tw- like a traditional D&D story for you guys, but honestly, I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And there is more if you guys want there to it's be more. It's wholesome as fuck. It is, it is wholesome as fuck. It's so cute. It is. It's adorable as anything. I really enjoyed it personally even though it's not for everyone's taste yeah i hope you guys enjoyed it because i honestly really want to go and do a part two slutty even yeah. though this video is long enough as it is but there is some more if you just want to hear it we yeah. can throw together a small video yeah i think you guys would like it well look as always hope you guys enjoyed like subscribe comment all, and share all that other good stuff check the links down below and we'll see you in the next video bye all those moments lost Time.